to Central Baptist Church. I'm Ken Adams, and as you can see, we're still online. This morning, we're going to look at the book of John, chapter 8. The longest lasting light bulb has been burning almost continuously for 119 years. It was switched off four times to move it, once during a building renovation, and twice due to power outages. Other than that, it's been burning for 119 years. Before artificial light lit people's homes, they used gas, kerosene, candles, wicks floating in olive oil in bowls, and fire on sticks. Before that, they used the sun. But before that, God illuminated everything. And God still lights up the world, especially through Jesus. John chapter 8 and verse 12 has Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. When Jesus said this, it meant something to people in ancient times as it means something to us. What did it mean to people in ancient times? Well, of course, they knew very much about physical light. They knew that physical light reveals truth, that there is no sight without light. You can't read without light. This is one reason that people went to bed so early in ancient times. Um, even with good lighting, you don't get good lighting in those days. And it was expensive, so they preferred daylight. No sight without light and a limited understanding of your surroundings. If you have never seen anything, if there is no light, what does a tree look like? What, to, what color is your favorite shirt? Without light, it's no color at all. And how do I determine the dimensions of my bedroom without light? Much truth is hidden in the dark. Light gives life. You know that plants need sunlight to grow. And the ancients knew that too, even though they didn't know how it happened, but they did know it was so. Plants turn sunlight into food, and we have that well figured out today. I don't even need to tell you about it because I'm sure you could tell me exactly how plants turn sunlight into food. But we know that animals eat plants, and if there are no plants, there are no animals. And we eat both plants and animals, and if there were no plants and animals, there would be no us. So all of us are dependent fundamentally on the life that light gives us. But it not only gives us life, it enhances life. It reveals the beauty of the world. It is why we can see red roses and yellow daisies and green grass. It is the light that shines through the woods, painting a golden rim around a leaf. And it guides our life. Headlights warn us of a fork in the road, and streetlights help you find your apartment door when it's very, very light, before it's very, very dark at night. Light protects you. It shows you the hole before you step into it. It unmasks the burglar before he breaks the window. On a particularly dark night, a tiny girl begged her mother, Mommy, will you sleep with me tonight? Her mother smiled and hugged her and said, Dear, I can't. I have to sleep with Daddy. Indignant, she replied, The big sissy. Light is more than physical. And it's more than spiritual, but it is spiritual. John chapter 3 and verse 19 says this. This is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. There is a spiritual light, 
and the spiritual light mimics physical light on many levels. It exposes sin. Spiritual darkness hides sin away, but spiritual light hits sin with a big spotlight and scatters sinners whenever it appears. Because when, when light appears, sin is revealed, and sinners are uncomfortable when their sins are revealed, and sinners are condemned when their sins are revealed, and a sinner realizes he is accountable. Sinners run from spiritual light because it demands that you make a change. And all of us know that change is hard. It's, it's painful. We'd rather sit in our recliner and, and not move, but the light causes us to realize that we should change. Spiritual light attracts truth, though, too. It has a, a negative and a positive. If you lose a button, you click on a light. If you want to read a book, you turn on a light. Christians prefer light to dark because it reveals our faults. Whoa, wait a minute. It reveals our faults and we prefer it? Yes, because Christians have God within, him, within them and God within us wants us to be like God. So it wants us to find our faults and correct them so we can be more like Jesus. And it leads us into the truth of God's will. Now, if you read about light from a scientific perspective, you'll find all kinds of words that are scientific in nature, like electromagnetic radiation and wavelengths and gamma rays and all that kind of stuff. But light is originally and ultimately a person. John starts his gospel by talking about light. Chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And it was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Light is ultimately a person. It is a personal light. Here in these verses we read that, that it is the Word of God. That it was in the beginning with God. That it is God. That light is superior to physical light. Spiritual light is superior to physical light. It is the light of men. It is the true light. It is stronger than darkness. It is Jesus. And Jesus made that claim in, in John chapter 8 and verse 12 when he said, I am the light of the world. The Jews knew that God was light. He'd been associated with light all of their history. When God spoke, first in the Bible he said, let there be light. He guided Israel with light. From the very beginning of Israel, Moses was, was brought to a, a burning bush. And God spoke out of that burning bush and, I, and introduced himself to Moses. Later on, when God wanted to move Israel through the wilderness, he appeared to them in a flaming cloud at night, moving them along with God commanded that light be introduced in the tabernacle, the worship center that Israel built for him in the wilderness. And when Solomon built a temple, he expanded that light ten times by putting ten lights in the temple instead of the just one. Jesus' life produced light. John chapter 8 and verses 1 through 5 tells us a story that you've probably heard before, but uh, I want you to realize it is in the context of what Jesus said when he said, I am the light of the world. Now Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. 
And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? Well, this is a setup. Jesus' life is going to produce light in this setup. Now, now think about the situation. What we've learned about the situation, some very simple things. First of all, we are at the temple. Inside the temple itself are ten lights, ten lampstands with oil and wicks and illuminating this room. But this room is covered in gold. The floor is covered in gold. The ceiling is covered in gold. All the walls are covered in gold. So if you were to walk into this, can you imagine how bright it would be to walk into this room that was small and lit with ten lampstands? It would be blindingly light, a symbol of God himself. So he's at the temple. And it's at dawn. And the light is coming up over the horizon. And the temple itself is facing east. And the sun is coming up, of course, in the east. And they are in courtyards that are surrounding the temple itself. And the light from the day is coming in and illuminating the people in this temple. This is the situation in which these men come to talk to Jesus. But not only was all this physical light basking everyone, but Jesus himself was teaching. And he was revealing God's truth and illuminating people's way. The darkness enters. Darkness is the scribes and the Pharisees. The religious leaders have staged an event. They have arrested an adulterous woman. Now, all of this obviously was prearranged. Adultery, by its very nature, is a private act. It seems that she was set up. And the logical way that this would progress would be to assume that the accuser was a participant in this adultery. The purpose of them bringing her to Jesus is not to enlighten anyone. It's not to purge Israel of sin. They had already discovered the sin. If they wanted to purge Israel of sin, they had the law. They could do with her what the law said. They could deal with the sin. But they brought her to Jesus because they intended to snuff out the light of the world. So they presented Jesus with a dilemma. Okay, Jesus, what do you think we should do? Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Well, it is a dilemma. It would be a hard one to get out of. If he condemned the woman, then Jesus is opposing the Roman government. The penalty for adultery under Mosaic law was stoning. The Jews had given up their right to execute criminals when they allow the Romans to take over their country. So it would be illegal for Jesus to stone her. It's illegal, technically, I suppose, for him to condemn her. If he was to condemn her to death, then the, the scribes and the Pharisees could accuse Jesus of rebellion, of sedition, and he would be subsequently arrested at the very minimum and tried as a traitor to the Roman government. In any event, the light would be snuffed out. On the other hand, if Jesus was to say, free her, well, that means Jesus is in opposition to the Mosaic Law. If he's in opposition to the Mosaic Law, he's in opposition to God's Law, because God gave this law to Moses. If he's in opposition to God's Law, he's opposed to God. If he's opposed to God, he can't be the Messiah because the Messiah is supposed to be God himself. So we got a problem here, don't we? This dilemma calls for the light of the world to shine. Here's the solution. Jesus wrote in the dirt. Look at verse 6. John chapter 8, verse 6. 
This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. What did he write? Well, I wish I knew. I think there's a million people that wish they knew how, what Jesus had written in this dirt, but we don't know. But the events that unfold indicate a couple of good guesses. What did Jesus write? Well, we do know this. We know that Jesus issued a challenge in verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her. Or as we sometimes say, let him throw the first stone, because that's exactly what would have happened. The accuser had to throw the first stone in the Old Testament method of execution. What did Jesus write? Well, I like to think that he might have written a verse from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 22, because it would be most relevant. If a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die. The man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shall you put away the evil from Israel. Now why this version of the crime of adultery? Why this version of the sentence? Well, maybe he also underlined the word both. Maybe, and it seems almost absolutely necessary, that one of the accusers was also her partner. So now Jesus is flipping things on its head and saying, you want to, uh, you want to execute the girl? Well, why don't we execute the guy as well? Because both of them are guilty. Maybe that's what he wrote. Maybe he wrote the names of her partners that were present. It was not unusual for the leaders to be involved in such things because after all, all you had to do uh, under the current state of affairs, no pun intended, was to offer a sacrifice. And so leaders uh, may very well have been involved in adultery. And maybe some of those present were her past partners. And maybe Jesus was just writing their names. If he wrote their names, and they were demanded that she be executed according to the Old Testament law, then they also were liable for death. In any event, Jesus shone as the light of the world. He revealed a solution to a thorny theological problem, which is this. How can a loving God judge a guilty sinner? He revealed a solution to a practical problem, which is how can a guilty sinner escape death. Well, Jesus is the light of the world. He exposed sin, which is what light does. He exposed the sin of the religious leaders. Somehow he exposed their sin, whether what I have concluded is what he wrote down or not. Verse chapter 8 and verse 9 says this, Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. They were embarrassed. They were ashamed. Uh, their, sin, their sin had been exposed. He exposed the sin of the religious leaders, and he exposed the sin of the woman. They had brought her to Jesus for one offense, one crime, the crime of one adulterous act. But notice what Jesus said, in verse 11, go and sin no more, which gives us the supposition that she was involved in a lifetime of this type of sin and probably was a prostitute. In any event, Jesus exposed sin because that's what light does. But he also gave life because that's what light does. He spared the adulterous woman. He said, I don't condemn you. 
go and sin no more. Any spirit, remarkably, the hypocritical leaders of Israel. He didn't demand that they face justice either. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is still the light of the world, and he wants to illuminate your life for good. Won't you let him shine on you today? I am the light of the world, Jesus said. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Thank you for being with us this morning as we've looked at the light of the world. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father, we do thank you for the illumination of Jesus and that we can see because of him. And the closer we get to him, as the closer you get to physical life, the, the more we can see. I pray for those listening that they will get close to you and see things that they never dreamed were possible. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.